I think we're ready. Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled Removing Algal Toxins from Drinking Water with Activated Carbon. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant research and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory and joining me today is John Lenhart. Dr. Lenhart is a professor of environmental engineering and associate chair in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Geodetic Engineering at Ohio State University. He is also the co-director of the Ohio Water Resources Center. He received his PhD in environmental science and engineering from the Colorado School of Mines. He followed that with a National Research Council postdoc fellowship at the U.S. Geological Survey and another postdoc position at Yale University. He joined the faculty at Ohio State in 2003, where his research interests are in environmental aquatic chemistry. He has authored or co-authored more than 100 publications and is the recipient of a National Science Foundation Career Award. We're delighted to have Dr. Lenhart here today to discuss his work on removing algal bloom toxins by way of activated carbon. But before we start, a few logistical mentions. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, around 12.20, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen and I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Lenhart at the end of his presentation. We have a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. So please keep those questions coming throughout the, your present, uh, throughout the presentation. And we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Lenhart from Ohio State University, who will present removing algal toxins from drinking water with activated carbon. Dr. Uh, Lenhart, I'm passing right. it on to you. Okay, great. I'm going to start my share. Perfect. Oops, didn't go to the beginning. All right, here we go. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good to be um, here today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss some of the research that we've been doing in my group over the last half a dozen years or so. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is present sort of an overview of some of the work that we've been doing um, specifically with powdered activated carbon um, associated with toxins produced during uh, seasonal harmful algal blooms. And so as a means of motivation, I think everybody's familiar with the blooms that have been occurring on Lake Erie and associated waters such as the Maumee River. So our work and involvement in this started um, soon after the um, episode in 2014 that impacted drinking water in Toledo. Um, and that then promulgated the development of this whole consortium of academics um, I'm under the Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative, which has been sort of administered and overseen through Sea Grant. So um, outside of the obvious aesthetic issues associated with algae blooms, there are a series of other potential impacts. I just want to walk through these real briefly. I think others that will be speaking in this series are going to cover some of these in more detail, but certainly there are health impacts associated with both human health and the environment. Um, in addition, we recognize that there are economic impacts. Um, the presence of the blooms is certainly an impact with respect to commercial fishery. Um, tourism takes a big hit associated with the impacts as well. Um, societal impacts are an issue, obviously, because um, em employment 
is uh, reduced when, when the blooms are present and there's a quality of life issue. Our particular interests are with respect to drinking water and specifically the production of safe drinking water. Um, and so certainly we know within the media that there has been a lot of interest associated with the presence of toxins and the algae in our drinking water sources. So there's some local evidence of that. One of the issues is associated with the lack of specific regulations um, and that then spurs additional uncertainty. But what I wanna recognize is that this is not strictly um, an issue with Ohio. It's um, national and as well as global issues. So for example, there are issues in West Virginia um, as well as in Florida. And so from my perspective, the provision of clean drinking water combines all three of these sort of issues in terms of health impacts, economic impacts, and societal impacts, all in one type bloom, because we're trying to provide safe, clean drinking water for the residents um, and customers from these utilities. So therefore, that leads me to my specific research objectives that my group follows. So again, we're looking to try to develop approaches to um, enhance removal of algal toxins during drinking water treatment. And again, for this specific research, we're talking about powdered activated carbon. And in this research, what we've done is look at different types of activated carbon um, and their performance. We've looked at different operating conditions and we have evaluated how the composition of the water and the toxins themselves influence things. And in terms of a goal, really our ultimate goal is to provide guidance and recommendations for utilities to better utilize PAC in their processes. All right, so here's my cartoon of a bloom. Those are my colleagues that have much more elegant images, I apologize, um, but we can envision a bloom as being comprised of microorganisms of um, different shapes and sizes. Um, the ones that are of concern are those primarily that are cyanobacteria and certain strains of cyanobacteria produce these toxins. Um, and we all recognize that these blooms are becoming more prevalent. And so certainly this is an issue to look into. With respect to toxin production and treatment, there are two categories of toxins to keep in mind. Those would be the intracellular toxins and the extracellular toxins. So the intracellular toxins, those ones sort of shown here, these are the ones that are produced within the um, cell itself and are retained within the cell. So the intracellular toxins are relatively easily removed um, as long as you can remove the cells and avoid disrupting the cells so that they're released into solution. The toxins are released into solution if the cells are disrupted. Um, and in certain instances, the toxins can also be released into solution by certain, certain cyanobacteria. So these toxins we call extracellular toxins. So these are the ones that are dissolved in the water outside the cell itself. And so for our research, specifically looking at the use of packed activated carbon, these are the types of toxins that we're interested in, the extra extracellular ones, the ones that are dissolved in water. Within a treatment system, this is um, my, my simplification of a, a conventional treatment system. What we're looking at is two basic outcomes. What we're trying to do is um, initially remove particles and stabilize the composition. So utilities will utilize um, a variety of chemicals, a coagulant, maybe polymer, maybe other um, pH adjustments to try to in, ensure particle removal during that step, get a stable composition. Um, and then at the end, prior to storage and distribution, they'll add some disinfectant to get um, further inactivation to prevent growth downstream. So this is conventional treatment. And by and large, um, most utilities in Ohio and in the region use, use a conventional type approach. And it works very well for most um, conventional pollutants. Um, but the problem occurs when we have sort of unconventional pollutants or emerging contaminants such as algal toxins. And in that case, the conventional approach does not work very well. Uh, so we need to look at additional approaches to try to look at the removal of these sorts of contaminants. The first line of defense in many instances is the use of powdered activated carbon. And so powdered activated carbon can be placed into the system early in the treatment train where it will be mixed with the other chemicals um, reacting during mixing or flock formation um, to remove the toxins. And then it can be removed during sedimentation or during filtration. So this is a 
a, a convenient way um, to sort of double dip, as it were, with respect to the existing treatment infrastructure to try to remove these toxins. And so what we are looking at specifically then is trying to better identify how to utilize PAC in this sort of an application. So the toxins that we looked at and that I'll be focusing on are um, of two categories. So we have microcystins and saxatoxins. So we looked at specifically microcystin LR and then saxatoxin itself. So you can see here, um, their structures are quite a bit different. Don't wanna to dwell too much on that. Some points that I want to sort of highlight are with respect to their toxicity. So saxatoxin is a neurotoxin. It's more commonly recognized as being an issue in um, marine systems where um, it can be accumulated by shellfish. Um, microcystin is a liver toxin. Um, other important details are with respect to the size. And this is something I'm gonna come back to a bit more. So you can see here, um, hopefully you can see my cursor, the, the molecular weight. So this is a proxy for the size of the sax toxin. So sax toxin is about 300. Microcystins are about 1,000. So the microcystin is roughly three times larger than is the saxatoxin. Um, another important feature is the fact that the saxatoxins have a charge that is positive under most um, water conditions that we'd be interested in. And microcystins, depending upon the specific microcystin variant, have different charges. But in the case of microcystin LR, it has a negative charge. Overall molecule charge is negative. Um, so these are important things to, to think about. And in terms of Ohio, we all know the microcystins are commonly measured. Microcystin LR is measured more often than our other variants. Um, saxatoxin has also recently been measured, um, but it, it, it occurs only occasionally. Um, so that's why we were looking at that one as well. So here's packed powdered activated carbon. So for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with powdered activated carbon, um, it's a powerful adsorbent on the basis of the extensive porosity that it contains. Um, so you can view it as being somewhat like a sponge. Um, and in terms of these pores, it's their size and how they're connected that is very important. So in this cross section schematic cartoon, we can see our powdered activated, part, powdered activated carbon particle showing some different pore types. So we've got macro pores, mesopores, and micro pores. So you can view the macro pores as those being that are relatively large, um, 50 nanometers or, or so in size and larger. Um, in between those, the medium sized are the meso and then the micro. So those are the small um, pore sizes around two microns or less. Um, and this is important when we're looking at different toxins that have different sizes. So these little, um, colored dots represent roughly the size of microcystin and saxatoxin. And then I have iodine on there because iodine is often utilized in uh, a measurement of the reactive surface area of powdered activated carbon because it is used to determine the iodine number. And um, the iodine, since it's small size, because of its small size is able to access pretty much all the pores within the, the powdered activated carbon. But depending upon your toxin, they may only be able to access certain pore types. And so that's an important consideration when you're looking at trying to remove these specific toxins. So if we try to, try to look then at where we might see removal of some of these toxins, we would see that the iodine again can pretty much probe all the pore types. The saxatoxin can probe um, certainly the macro and the meso um, and maybe a portion of the micro. Um, the microcystin, however, it's really only going to be able to utilize the macro pores and the mesopores. It is not going to be able to utilize any of the reactive surfaces within the micropores. That's important to consider. So in recognition of this, making decisions on the type of pack to use, um, it's important to understand some of the features of the toxin um, because that needs to then correlate to the properties of the carbon. Other sort of secondary considerations would be other properties of the carbon in terms of its charging um, because different carbon sources have different charging behavior. And in some cases that becomes an issue as well. So overall, when we're thinking about using PAC, we need to think about the characteristics of the carbon. We need to think about the characteristics of the toxin and then the characteristics of the water. So what I'm going to highlight 
are some of our results where we've looked at different carbon characteristics. So we understand that um, the physical and chemical properties of the carbon vary, and so I'll highlight some of those. Um, the toxin characteristics, certainly we know that the physical and chemical properties vary, and so I'll highlight a little bit of those variations. And then water characteristics vary. So we've looked at a different a variety of different water characteristics, but I want to focus on for just today is just a summary of how we see natural organic matter impacting removal. So here's a summary of some of our, our results looking at the role of carbon properties. So in this plot, I'm just looking at what I have determined is the relative removal rate. And so this is um, the rate constant benchmarked to the slowest value um, for each data set. So for microcystin LR, that would be our bituminous coal based carbon. So that is benchmarked with a value of one. And what you can see then is that the rate at which in um, the toxin, in this case, microcystin LR is removed from solution with wood based carbon is a little more than 10 times faster than is the bituminous coal. Um, and so then for the saxitoxin, it's the same sort of thing, but it's benchmarked to this coconut one. So the coconut one removal rate is one and the coal blend and wood-based carbon remove saxitoxin at roughly twice the rate of coconut. So from this diagram, what we can see is that the carbon properties are very important for the removal of both of these toxin types. Um, but what is clear is that the differences in removal rate for the different carbon types is um, more important for microcystin, microcystin LR in this case, than it is for saxitoxin. And finally, what, this all, what our results also demonstrate is that the wood-based carbon removes the toxins to, um, to a faster, or removes toxin more rapidly than do the other carbon types. And um, the reason why it is a reflection of the, the properties and specifically the pores and um, the pore volumes associated with these different carbon types. So simplistically, we can view the wood-based carbon as being comprised of a significant portion of our medium or meso-sized pores. The coconut, on the other hand, is comprised mostly of very small, the, 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 the micro-sized pores. And the coal, depending upon the coal type or the blends, are going to have um, a variation of these pore types. So our wood-based carbon, because of these greater proportion of these medium-sized pores, they're going to be better able to accommodate most of our toxin types, microsystem being a larger toxin is removed much more readily with wood than would be a coconut. The coconut that we use does very poorly with the microcystin. On the other hand, for the smaller toxins like saxitoxin, all of our carbons work sort of the same because the size of the sax, sax, saxitoxin allows it to access a variety of pore types. Um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about are the toxin properties. So, um, the properties of the toxin, in this case, I'm showing a partition coefficient um, as a function of either saxitoxin or microcystin for a variety of different carbon types. Um, and so two things to take from this. The first is that the microcystin is removed. Its affinity for the carbon is much greater than is the saxitoxin. So this is a log scale. So our partition coefficient for our microcystin compared to our saxitoxin is um, two orders of magnitude greater. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing that's important is in, in terms of, of, of affinity, the affinity of these particular toxins for the carbon is that they're relatively independent of the specific carbon type because for all intents and purposes, the carbon surfaces are more or less the same. It's the presence of the different pore types that becomes important. So when trying to understand um, why the microcystin is attracted to the saxitoxin to a greater extent, um, it's important to understand the properties of these molecules. So the size um, and the charge and the solubility are the important factors. So the smaller size, greater polarity of the saxitoxin reduces it, its attraction to the carbon. On the other hand, the microcystin has a larger size, it's less soluble, and so that results in it being attracted to the carbon to a much greater extent. 
We've also done some work with different variants of microcystin, and we do see within you know those variant classes um, of microcystin they have different properties that there are variations in the removal. So within a particular um, category of toxins, you'll see variations in removal based upon which variants are present. Um, lastly, we'll talk a bit about some of the results we've collected with respect to the water composition. So one of the important um, factors is to understand how organic matter is influencing removal. So in this diagram, I have shown again the relative removal rate um, for our different carbon types. And this is specific for just microcystin LR. And what we're looking at is different concentrations of organic matter based on the measured total organic carbon concentration. So we have systems with zero organic matter um, and systems with five milligrams per liter on the basis of the carbon concentration. Um, and so what we can see is that the presence of the organic matter reduces the rate at which the toxin is removed. Um, our system without any organic matter, we see much greater removal, particularly in the case of the wood-based carbon than in systems with two and a half or five milligrams per liter of, of carbon. Um, another important factor is that the degree at which the organic matter influences removal, um, it, it varies to some extent for the different carbon types, and maybe this isn't illustrated most clearly. Um, its impact on the wood-based carbon was less than its impact on the other carbon types. And so that's, again, a function of the physical features of the wood-based carbon, the large concentration of the mesopores, and um, how those mesopores are connected to one another. So when we think about competition, we're looking at microcystin and saxitoxin, um, and then we think about our natural organic matter. So the natural organic matter is comprised of molecules of different sizes and different properties. And so the competition is then gonna vary depending upon the organic matter composition and where it um, interacts with the carbon. So we can get our organic matter actually blocking some pores for larger organic matter molecule types Smaller organic matter molecules may actually adsorb to the active carbon surfaces, in which case they compete for those surfaces and those sites with the toxin. So both of these impact removal, decrease the removal rate either by occluding or blocking the pores or by um, competing for surface sites. And that's gonna be a function of the specific toxin and that's gonna be a function of the specific carbon type. Um, one thing I wanna point out before I move on is, is we did similar experiments with saxitoxin and for reasons we're not fully, um, we don't fully understand, um, the influence of organic matter is much lower for saxitoxin than it is for the microcystin. So um, we see more or less the same removal of saxitoxin independent of the presence of our organic matter or even our organic matter type. So just to kind of summarize in terms of management implications. So the carbon that has significant medium-sized pores, the mesopores, in our case, it was wood. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't other carbon types that have high mesoporosities. So those pro perform best for the toxins we looked at. Um, considerations would be with respect to performance on taste and odor compounds. So in many cases, that is another driver for the choice of the carbon. The other, um, sort of management implication take home message is, is it's important to understand the type of toxin because its properties can be important in terms of removal. So we saw much greater removal of microcystin than we did with saxitoxin. Our removal or our studies with different microcystin types show that the type of microcystin that is present is also important. Um, so if having that information it is also important to know. Um, and then the composition and that's specifically with respect to organic matter. Um, because the presence of organic matter it, uh, competes. And then, you know, depending upon your carbon type, depending upon your toxin, that level of competition can be a much, can be very important or in some cases less important. Other things to consider would be the cost. Um, I evaluated costs a couple of years ago. I don't know how much they've changed. And for the carbon types that we were looking at, they were all similarly priced. I'm not sure if that's still the case or not. Um, but that is a consideration. All the carbons that we looked at were sourced locally, um, but we did not look at whether 
they are present in you know quantities that are you know in bulk, but they are commercial. We're all commercially available and we're locally sourced. Um, there is a certain level of confidence with respect to using materials that are are familiar versus those that are new. Um, and we also didn't look at how easily or hard the different carbon types might be removed during subsequent treatment steps. And then finally, the, the, the management of the residuals is certainly an issue of concern. The toxins are going to be bound to the, to the powdered activated carbon that will then be associated with the residuals that are removed during sedimentation. Or, and then, you know, depending upon the management of those residuals, you have to consider what will happen with those specific toxins. And so this is not a question that we have looked at. Um, others are looking at this though. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, certainly support for the research from the Ohio Department of Higher Education through their Harmful Algal Broom Research Initiative, um, the support of Ohio Sea Grant. Some of our research was um, done in conjunction with uh, Target Metabolomics Laboratory at Ohio State. There have been a series of graduate students that have worked on this, um, Ashnika, Yenling, Kate, and Yujo as well as a bunch of other undergraduate student, students um, who unfortunately I don't have pictures of. And so hopefully I have not used up too much time because I'm happy to answer questions at this point. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Linhart. We have gotten some great questions during your presentation. So let me get started and what, uh, questions that Dr. Lenhart isn't able to answer, we will have those questions answered and posted on the website. So um, feel free to keep on putting in more questions and we will get answers to those. <clears throat> All right, so let me, um, let me start with, uh, we had quite a few questions dealing with basically the, uh, the process, your process. And so let me just kind of go through several of these. Uh, several questions were answered uh, dealing with the different types of PAC that you used. So uh, you answered all of those. One of the questions that we had was dealing with your dosing, um, your, your dosing recommendations were if you were using water, um, Ohio water that was experiencing harmful algal blooms. Um, and another question dealing with your experiments at a pH eight level that is more of a marine environment than a freshwater environment. So I kind of wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about the types of water you used. Okay, um, so, so the types of water we use. So um, the pH 8 was determined on the basis of an evaluation of um, sort of data provided through Ohio EPA for um, bloom conditions. So pH 8 is a typical pH for bloom conditions. Um, I recognize it's a little higher than what is an, an, a normal pH, but during bloom conditions, the pH can actually go up to around 9. Um, so the pH of 8 was based on that. Um, all of our systems were done using a water that we prepared in a lab that had a composition that was synthesized to mimic the average sort of Ohio surface water composition. And I'm happy to share what that composition was in terms of the salts that we use, the, the alkalinity, um, things like that, um, its conductivity. And then in terms of the organic matter, we looked at a couple of different organic matter types, one of which we isolated from Grand Lake St. Mary's, um, one of which was a terrestrial organic matter type, which is the Suwannee River fulvic acid. And in, in some instances, we saw a difference between these organic matter types. And in some instances we didn't see. And so that's a question we're trying to iron out specifically with the Grand Lake St. Mary's because it seems like its properties vary depending upon the time of year at which you collect and isolate it. Um, so that, that's kind of our, our water composition. Um, did I answer that question then? I think so. I think so. Um, specifically, one, one of the questions dealing with a pH level of eight were you able, could you talk a little bit about why that was chosen? Yeah, so I mean, pH 8, again, based on our compilation 
of water composition from a variety of surface waters in Ohio, that is sort of an average pH during a bloom. So that is actually a pH that we benchmarked from data that we collected from, you know, a variety of sources in Ohio. And okay. in some instances, it goes up to nine. Um, but I mean, we've also looked at other pHs. We looked at pHs all the way from five to nine. So we have data for all of those. I just didn't present those. And so in the end, the pH really matters. It, it is an important factor in the overall removal because not only does the um, absorption of the toxin to the carbon vary, but the absorption of the organic matter to the carbon varies. And it's a very complicated sort of dance between all of those. And um, I'd be happy to talk to whomever posed those questions about that in a lot more detail, because okay. that's, a, that's a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, has there been any work done with um, different types of wood um, to see which one is more effective than others? So we used a specific um, wood-based carbon, um, wood-based, excuse me, wood-based, yeah, wood-based carbon. But there, there are others in the literature. Um, I mean, I, I can show quickly. There's, a, I have a table here of, um, so this sort of talks about some of the carbon types that we looked at. So our, our wood-based carbon is an aqua neutral product, um, but there are others and by and large, my understanding of their properties is that they're all fairly similar in terms of their physical and chemical properties. Um, one of the things that might be different is depending upon how they're activated, whether it's a chemical activation or a steam activation, because that changes the charging characteristics of the carbon and how it interacts with the toxin. So ours is a chemically activated carbon. Um, but other wood-based carbons are gonna have similar surface areas, they'll have similar poor volume properties. Um, so, I mean, that, you know, by and large, the, the source of the material um, provides a carbon is very, very similar in terms of its properties. All right, thank you. Um, let me see, a few other questions that we had was, um, do you, um, sorry, I'm, we're getting a lot of questions. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> I'm trying to I'll, go through them and see. I mean, if we want to kind of, you know, if we can pull them off the chat, I'd be happy to try to, you know, respond with answers afterwards. Yeah, there's some that are very, very specific. So um, I think that will be very helpful um, if you don't mind doing that. Yeah, and that way not we, at all. they can get those answers. Um, can you, what, um, what is, this was an, a question I got a couple of times. Um, what is the common disposal practice of used activated carbon? Um, well, certainly we have to understand the type of activated carbon. So there are two forms of activated carbon that are utilized. Um, the research that I was discussing today is the powdered form of activated carbon. So that's a, a very fine, um, material. And so it's added in treatment and then it is removed during settling. Um, and so then it's going to be managed based upon how that particular utility manages their solid residues. So they may landfill it. They may, um, you know, in some cases that those, those materials could be beneficially reused. So that will depend upon how those solids are, are, are utilized. And then subsequently the fate of those particular toxins. Um, in the case of the granular form of activated carbon, which we've also done research on, so that is regenerated typically by combustion, in, in which case the toxins um, would be presumably destroyed during the combustion process as the granular activated carbon is um, sort of regenerated. So, I mean, in, in short, th there is a question with respect to the management of um, the water treatment residuals that have the powdered activated carbon sort of incorporated. But I do believe that there are researchers through the HABRI program that are looking at that. 
Great. And we'll get, um, we have uh, the HABRI report from this um, past year that will have a lot of those um, research results in the chat feature. So feel, and we'll be sending that out to, uh, to everyone uh, here following the webinar. So that some of those resources will be available to all of you either in the chat or by email. Um, one, and I will, because we are getting ones that are very specific, um, one question I did want to ask you, and maybe we just um, end with this question and um, do some follow-ups with the Q&A um, on the website. Um, this question uh, is, can you talk a little bit about how municipalities have taken this information, your research, and use it um, in their water treatment plants? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I have had some conversations with um, different plant operators um, sort of relaying these results. And, um, you know, I, I'm not 100% certain that they have made um, specific changes. I think in some cases it's reinforced some of the decisions that they were already making and um, providing them with greater confidence that the decisions that they are making are based on sound science. So, uh, you know, I think in many cases that it just increasing their level of confidence with respect to the decisions that they're making is, is one way that I would look at it. Um, but, you know, I'd be happy to learn more about whether um, folks are, are, are looking at results like this or, or results that others are, are collecting and are, are, are trying to incorporate that into making some changes. Great, great, thank you. Uh, well, um, just because of time, I would like to try to, we'll have all the questions that all of you have Posted, um, we will uh, touch base with uh, Dr. Lenhart and get those questions answered and post that onto our webinar series website. Um, so I want to um, just again thank you, Dr. Lenhart, for your willingness to talk to us today about your harmful algal bloom research. It was really an excellent discussion. We really appreciate it. I also want to uh, have a a thank you out to Christina Dierkes for her work organizing this webinar series. I think this is gonna be a great webinar series. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that the, our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. Uh, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Glenn Lipcomb from the University of Toledo who will be talking about his research stopping algal bloom toxins at the kitchen tap. And the registration link is in the chat. Thank you again to, to Dr. Lenhart. Your research is amazing. So we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, as well as all the participants on the webinar. Thank you for your time. We hope that this was beneficial and hope that you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Lenhart.